So we're talking about preparing for a post-oil economy. Now, experts are saying by 2030, which is exactly nine years from now, Nigeria will enter a post-oil age. For decades, we have actually failed to translate the wealth in the oil economy into the development of the common man. So I, you can imagine that this is scary when you think about Nigeria without oil, and we're still pretty much largely a mono economy. So what does this mean when we talk about an oil economy going away? It means job losses. It means increased poverty. But guys, I really want us to think of something else, apart from just feeling afraid that with all the oil wealth, unemployment is still at 5% and is really, really high. And that's contest contestable. It could even be way higher than that. So post-oil economy, it's something we need to talk about. But here is the interesting part, guys. There is a good news, even in the seemingly bad news. We have to realize the opportunity a post-oil economy affords us. There is an opportunity to truly diversify an economy as 2030 approaches. So our biggest threat is not that oil will run out or that the world will stop buying oil, but rather our inability to capitalize on this fast-rushing wave of innovation to rewrite the destiny of the nation come 2030. So at this crucial junction, I think for me, one of the important things we must understand that innovation is going to be the determinant factor here if we're going to survive in the future. It's expected that the post-industrial economy will be a creative economy. And in every family, there's a creative person. I mean, we're in the age of the creative economy, but think about it for a second. The structures that can drive the creative economy is not even there. Many creative people cannot find a enabling environment to produce either songs or their movie. Everyone is running around. The fashion ones cannot actually scale because the economy and the structure to help them scale is not even there. So the creative economy makes up about $2.2 trillion in revenues and about 30 million plus jobs globally. So it is the fastest growing segment in the world. Creative industries are recognized as a source of innovation, economic growth, personal well-being, community cohesion. Like, think about it, the creative economy is the future. If we want to attack unemployment, we cannot not talk about the creative economy. So economic success on a level requires that we have to harness our creative economy. We have to put it together, the structures, the policies that can drive them, protect our IPs, put piracy laws in place so people can thrive. Now, according to the National Bureau of Statistics, I think this report was in 2016. They said that our GDP as of 2015, about 94.14 trillion came from um, the creative sector. Now, further analysis of this data from the report indicates that the sector could, even with the state of it is, which is not structured, informal, can contribute in way more than we can actually see. In the US, it's about 5.3% com coming from the creative sector. So with music going global, and all the streaming platforms, with movies going global, with fashion going global, we cannot begin to, to undermine the potential in that segment. So my, my, my advocacy today is to really ask the question, now what are we doing with the music? What are we doing from arts to entertainment to recreation, the stories that we have? Most of us grew up reading literature. Those things can actually rival international movies. They can become series, they can become feature films globally, and they can make money because they're exportable. So guys, I'm talking about this huge potential within the creative sector that we're not tapping as a country. We complain about unemployment being high, and of course it's going to remain high for a long time because unemployment, they don't go away. There's something called cyclical unemployment, which is that at the end of the day, with innovation, some jobs will be dis dissolved. Jobs will go. Innovation will swallow up jobs. But how do we position our educational sector so it can create? I'm talking about how we can strip down our economic model, our educational model, and actually allow innovation to drive. Some courses have no business being studied in the world today. If blockchain is the, is the backbone of the industrial age, the fourth industrial revolution, why is blockchain not part of our cu curriculum? But our government is placing a ban on cryptocurrency, on anything that looks like blockchain. They're regulating the, 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 uh, the, the fintech space. But this is where they're supposed to be putting the best foot forward to ensure that we have enough jobs for our young people. If we kill innovation, we've killed the future. Oil is not going to be around that much. And it's good news for me because people will go to power because they want to be able to get easy access to contracts, can no longer go. Now, despite high informal sector, the creative economy still has a lot of potential. This inactive state is due to structural gaps, and we can fix that. Policies, theories, we can do that. Conferences, programs that can help drive that space. Guys, I think we need a new generation of revolutionary thinkers, artists, producers, writers, who can create this compelling story of a new Nigeria. We are not just here. Nigeria is the dream. We are the Nigerians. If this country will arise, if there will be jobs, we have to do it ourselves. I mean, people can go to Canada, but not all of us can go to Canada. There is more potential here. The resources are here. How do we harness that? We have resources, but are we resourceful? 
If you're creative, I'll say, welcome to the world. Your time has come. I think that I would wow. like to take you right on in that. You see, a very, very interesting advocacy, I must say. But the challenge that I have with what we, what this kind of narrative, which is going across in different places, is that when we galvanize all the emotions, what are the solutions? What is the way forward? What is it that is being done? So we, you have whipped up quite a lot of sentiments and people. The creative sector is there. And you've listed the big box that is right in that system. But what is going to be done? Who is going to wake up and say, let's start guiding ourselves? We have over 200 million people. And I, over 50% of those are young people. Mm. So can somebody tell me why the creative sector is not doing better than it's doing? Are we still waiting for government? I have a, I have a real challenge with the fact that government needs to do something. And I'm not saying that the government or policies are not faulty or that mm -hmm. there are issues. But have you ever thought of that? Um, was it, who was it that? Have you ever thought of what the power of a small group of determined people can do? I don't think we're determined enough for what you're advocating for. I told you, when I was younger, my, my mom could not even allow me to write or, or become a writer because how are you going to pay the bills? If you are a musician, how are you going to survive? No, that is changing. We're seeing a That's musicians. a total paradigm shift. Uh, and yeah, you know, uh, what, what, what you said... But the government really, is not catching it, up with it. It really hits home. I remember as... I think I was in GS3. The first time I picked up a jam brochure, my eldest brother was writing jam. And so I flipped through... Of course, then it was this bulky book that... Hundreds of pages. And then I got... I'll never forget, I got to University of Calabar. And I saw theater arts mm -hmm. and that course jumped out of the page literally and hit me in my soul and i blotted out i'm going to study theater you switched? arts mm -hmm. the moment i made that statement my mom was sitting in the living room <laughs> and she said god bless her soul and she said no she just said let your father hear you <laughs> oh and goodness. that killed yes, yes you know and then i had to struggle through the sciences mm. because they wanted me to study medicine and you know the fun and it's very funny while in primary school, I was in a drama and I played the role of the doctor and everybody told me, my God, you did it so well. You're going to be a good doctor when you grow up. <laughs> Meanwhile, they ought to have told me you could you're going to be a doctor. good actor. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, I mean, back to what you're saying, Eniton, the beautiful thing about the creative industry, you really, you need very little external motivation mm. or push mm -hmm. to rise up where you are with what you have and begin to run. There, there is also a need for policy, policy push. Oh, definitely. You see, in Nigeria, your, your business, your idea is likely to die. Not by competition mm -hmm. or lack of funds or profit, but by government regulation and policies. Mm. So you are likely to be regulated out of business mm. before True. any factors mm. coming from within or from your competitors. So is, there, there, there used to be a very big industry in this country, the VAS sector. That mm. is the uh, value-added services in the telephone. It's talking about callback tones, pock SMS. Mm. Mm. Those have been regulated out of NCC business. NCC killed it, yeah. Mm. What did he say? NCC, they killed it. I know. Mm. But I just wanted you to echo it. This is what, those are the things that we act on to the creative industry. So we need to go back to the basis. You see, when you take all of this to the National Assembly, to the State House of Assembly, I'm telling you, 80% of the time, mm. they will never understand you. We go back to the thumb printing, your right. votes, Correct. the people that represent you, the policy mm. maker, the people that are going to drive the policy that will that affect will this creative sector. So I, I tell you most sincerely that politics determines everything. And I will always say, Correct. politics is too important to be left to the politicians. You know, it's going to affect every other thing. Yes, see, what I agree, no, I guess, no, because you see, something different. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with what you gentlemen have said. But one thing I have come to understand is that there's got to be a high level of, like I was discussing before we went on the show, there has got to be a way where we make psychology and strategy. There was a particular movie that I worked about a lady, a lobbyist in the United States, and it has forever changed my mind. It was titled Miss Sloan. I don't know how one woman single-handedly was able to penetrate into the American, American legal system and be able to influence policy. So I think that one thing that we don't push or fight for or talk about in Nigeria is how we can actually get and penetrate politicians. I'm not saying that we're going to, there's something called lobbying. Most people want to physically be the person who is a frontliner mm. or say, how do you actually change policies? You know, until, until we move our politics in Nigeria from a patriarchal or 
um, God worshipper system mm. to the point where politicians are answerable to the electorate. Like the recent um, um, hoopla that happened on June 12th, Democracy Day, and people went on the streets, you know, ranting that the president has to go and all that. I just looked at it and I said, okay, this is still, we're still having PTSD from the military era. Yes. You don't unseat a sitting president through, you know, um, going protesting and no, all that. You don't. He has the, the mandate. Is the protest. He has the mandate. He has the votes. The constitution backs him. The only thing that can remove a sitting democratically elected president is death or impeachment. So rather than go on the streets and shout and make a whole lot of noise, begin to lobby your representatives that's it. at the state and that at the it. national that level. Exactly you, now, just saying. give me a minute. By the time you do that and then begin to threaten that person, if you want Im impeachment, for example, let you your people, your people. Ch you channel it through them. Let them bring it up to the house so that it's up for debate. And then you, put, you can even threaten or blackmail that person, quote unquote, if you don't get this on your own seat. It's not, you see, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, politics is a game of selfish interest. That's it. Right? But like I keep saying, until we move the way a political system is mm. from the place of rank adedi to a place of I'm sending you there, these are my expectations based on the law. We'll keep running around in circles and nothing will get you, done. You have a good point. And I think everything rises and falls on the, the knowledge of the people in every mm. society. And like I said, protest is therapeutic but it doesn't translate always. Mm, uh, yeah, so it's just correct. a tactic. We need a strategy. Mm. Fantastic. Guys, we're going to go on a quick break, and after that, Kemak will come back to give us a life lesson. You want to hang around?